Robert Smithson Mundus Subterraneus, Early Works. This is an exhibition that focuses on Robert Smithson's drawings made between 1960 and 1964. And I really think in so many ways, it's a surprise. Mm -hmm. When we think about Robert Smithson's work, we think about his charismatic, his iconic work, Spiral Jetty yeah. from 1970. But we don't think about these works, or maybe we don't even know about these works. There's a really fabulous interview that Robert Smithson gave in 1972 for the Archives of American Art. And he describes that before 1964, he was making art in a groping, investigative way. Mm -hmm. And so much scholarship has said, well, it's after 1964 that matters. But yeah. we really wanted in this exhibition to think, well, what is a groping, investigative phase within an artist's practice? And I think something that's very important when we consider Robert Smithson's work is that the Robert Smithson who we know is a Robert Smithson whose oeuvre was really led by the artist Nancy Holt. So Smithson was born in 1938 in New Jersey, and he passed away in 1973. And from 1973 onwards, his partner, Nancy Holt, looked after his estate. And she really focused on certain works, on mm. his earthworks. And it's not that she hid this body of work, it's just that it wasn't circulated. So, Adrian, we really wanted to ask you to think with us about this work. This work that there has been some important scholarship on. I'm particularly thinking about Eugenie Sy's 1991 book, which was the very first time the work was published. But here, in this exhibition, I really feel that there's so much to learn about Smithson. And he also says in this interview that he was interested in this early period in primordial beginnings. And I think we can see the beginnings of everything we see in the later work. He's interested in ruins, in the fall of European civilization, in everything being both and, never either or. Mm -hmm. And for you, Adrian, we really wanted to think with you, with your erudite take in art history, where you think between the yeah. ideas. Now, I mean, for me, Smithson, I'm happy these exist, and I'm happy to have come to know them. And I understand the importance, when you put it that way, of his groping beginnings. Because throughout most of my reading life of art criticism, Smithson has always been one of the best art writers I know. I have no doubt about that. And one of the things I've emphasized in my little essay is that this is necessarily a kind of autobiographical imagination as well. I couldn't come to Smithson as a Smithson scholar. And it's true, as you say, he's attracted a lot of very, very good writing, starting with Eugenie Sai up to Philipp Orsprung and now Suzanne Berger and the younger writer who's just written on these. And if Smithson speaks about groping through something, then it must be important because he, he's doing this work at the point where Freed is beginning to think about minimalism and conceptualism. It finishes three years, I think, before Freed, his um, article on art and objecthood. Mm -hmm. It's coming at the height of Greenbergism, the beginnings of Rosalind Krauss's and whatever you want to say. So everything is available for him about how to work, but he's doing this. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, once I came to go through the work, as you sent to me, is quite extraordinary, that it poses a whole set of questions 
about what it is that the histories we have written up to now are. Mm. It knocks a big hole in them. If I could make a slightly offbeat comparison, some years ago at the Pompidou Centre, Natasha Petrescian did an exhibition called Les Promesses du Passé, The Promises of the Past, which was about Eastern European conceptualism, particularly in Yugoslavia, under the communist regime. And it was just riveting because you realize that the claims made by the American conceptualists, whether it's the left conceptualists like Martha Rosler or the mainstream conceptualists, was a drop in the ocean. You know, we thought it was the narrative, but she showed by putting some rather conventional painting on the wall what a teacher in the Yugoslav art school was doing in this period. And then in a small showcase was his serious work, which he kept in his desk drawer so that no one would ever see it or see it as work. So this is a similar revelation that you suddenly see that the history of something which has been written over and over again is actually unwritten. And I think this idea of questions, for me, in every moment I look at these drawings, there's more and more questions. Mm. There's not a single drawing in this exhibition that doesn't make me frown. It's yeah. difficult and it's impossible to fathom. And we cannot ask Smithson, why did you use these images? What fascinated you about these bodies? What fascinates you about these numbers? All we mm. can do is see what's there. And, and I think mm. one of the powerful things about Smithson's work is it's like mercury. It moves and shifts mm. with different contexts. The work means one thing now in 2024. But of course, he made these in the 60s, 61, 63, 64. Mm. It almost feels as if we're seeing a body of work in advance of its own times. Yeah. So Smithson is as interested in occult books mm -hmm. as he is in the dogmas of religion, as he is in the symbolism of totalitarianism. And I think we have to really remember here in Paris that Smithson was an American artist. And the images he's, wor he's working with are images mm. rather than experiences. So it's this sense of mediation and remediation. Mm. What does it mean to use these symbols, these pictures? Yes, and then there I, I find that there's oddly, despite the density and complexity, and you imagine his working process, almost something, what can I say, very restrained about it. Hmm. It what is really someone that? contemplating a vocabulary, mm -hmm. contemplating the way in which you can produce signifiers and see mm -hmm. if they add up to anything, mm -hmm. if ever some kind of complete experience will arise from them. Mm -hmm. And this is where thinking about him and thinking about his library, which obviously is listed in all the major works in different versions, his relationship to mysticism, his relationship to, if you like, obscurantism mm. and darker texts, mm. and the relationship of those to the ecstatic forms of mysticism which he read about, mm. say in the works of Evelyn Underhill. And all, all of these, oddly enough, are books that I read as well. And also some of the more you know, ecstatic science fiction works, some of Ballard, um, some of the detective fiction he read. All these are books which have some element of revelation. Mm -hmm. The density between, the relation, should I say, between the density of what you see in the world, the oddity of Ballard's drowned worlds, for mm -hmm. example, and some revelation which might occur. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think if you are a good Catholic mystic in the great tradition, the revelation is something which you can only describe to people when you come out of the state of contemplation and at the point that you no longer know whether you yourself have seen it, mm -hmm. what you can only talk to about other people is what 
it is that you might have seen had what you hoped to have taken place mm. has taken place. So what's so great about this, yeah. and I've, I've never thought about, made this connection before, it's this power of rumor. Mm. So I'm very interested in Spiral Jetty, that Spiral Jetty is an artwork that is many things. It's an earthwork, mm. it's a film, it's an essay, but even more importantly than that, it's a rumor. It's located in a remote location. And when I say remote, I mean remote from the international art centers. Mm. Um, and so it survives through its rumor. But this idea of mysticism, um, it has its power through rumor. Mm. And perhaps that's why there's something critically charged about the symbols, the images, mm. the references, that it's almost as if Smithson is raising one eyebrow and saying, let me throw this at you. Mm. What do we do with it? Yeah. And one could come back to the mystery experience then, someone like Teresa of Avila, whom he read, and uh, her castle. Um, there's a, there's, a, there's a rather wonderful Spanish series, you know, melodramatic series about the life of Teresa. And there's one point where she's having an ecstasy and one of her nuns is listening through the door and thinking, is she all right? Mm -hmm. Because she can't really believe this is sex and ecstasy. There's just one person, in, you know, one saint in the room. And, and just that thing of overhearing mm -hmm. the mystical experience mm. Is a rumor. That's the structure of rumor. What is it you've heard? What is it you pass on to mm -hmm. the other sisters mm -hmm. in the in, in, in nunnery? So I, I think that relation between that kind of desire for that experience and the desire for rumor. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I think in a sense we can say they're related. Mm -hmm. But Smithson, as with everything, is is also almost too conscious of those processes. Mm -hmm. He's almost too rational, he's too clinically analytic in his thinking, really to pull that off, I think. Mm -hmm. So maybe these images, however dense and wonderful we find them, are also a kind of ongoing failure. Mm -hmm. Yet he never reaches the moment of signification. Mm -hmm. And that both is maybe something he's after, that the failure then becomes his success, mm -hmm. or rather the ineluctable outcome. You know, sometimes I think in its kind of a slightly cruel way to think that Smithson believed in deeply in the theory of entropy. He was fascinated by the theory of entropy. As many artists I knew slightly later were, entropy theory was a big thing. How do you construct a system and how does it go wrong? The mm -hmm. co constructivists in England were fascinated by entropy theory, as was Smithson, but he creates devices that defy entropy. Mm -hmm. As you say, spiral jet is so many things, mm -hmm. so many forms of experience, so many kinds of rumor, mm -hmm. that it completely floats away from the rundown of the entropy. Mm -hmm. The only time he truly experienced entropy was the crashing of his aeroplane. Mm -hmm. Then he got it. Mm -hmm. The point the machine stopped, was his death. Mm -hmm. And there's something horribly ironic and sad mm -hmm. about the fact that if Smithson never caught up with entropy, mm -hmm. it caught up with him. Hmm. And throughout Smithson's work, he was always more interested in the peripheries than the center, yeah. whatever the peripheries may be, because we, as we know, so often the periphery becomes the center by being on the outside. And mm. we're both sitting here with this really beautiful newspaper that the yeah. gallery has produced for the exhibition. And you've written this elliptical essay, Adrian, where you're taking this, this journey through, um, and forgive me if I'm reading this wrong, but I would say this journey through the atmosphere of these works yeah. and, and something you're very, um, vehement in this elliptical essay about is that you have no interest in the biographical reading no. of, of Smithson. 
So um, we're looking at these drawings that with today's language, we would say they're queer drawings, but it, Smithson's own sexuality, that's irrelevant. Mm. What matters is the work that's left behind. Mm. What are these objects doing? What are they evoking, invocating? What yeah. atmosphere are they proposing? Yes. And, and, and in that sense, I want to think of them as being enunciations. They're kind of complex, limping, hesitating, over-emphatic, mm -hmm. sometimes screaming enunciations. And again, I think in the period when I came across him, which was the late 60s reading art form, and I think it was really, as I said, his writing that saved me from the Greenberg freed configuration because he was so much more coherent and interesting than they were for me. But it's true that we all love Wittgenstein and people still do, but it was a very odd love of Wittgenstein because you only had to have read two or three pages of the Tractatus, which is what most people did read, you know, the beginning and then the end, to see that one would like to be able to speak like that. So I think quite a lot of us at that time in our different ways went around speaking as if we were speaking in limping propositions. Mm -hmm. And there's this kind of stop start thing which became a way of inserting yourself into a mode of doing philosophy without having to understand that philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what Smithson understood of Wittgenstein. I don't know if he read the book from beginning to end I don't know, in that sense, you have to go through all his things and see what he underlined. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right, it's a kind of atmosphere mm -hmm. surrounding the kind of person who read that kind of book. We've got lots of kind ofs. Yes. And those kind ofs are what we can bring to reading or looking at or speaking through these works and seeing that the, you know, entrenched scholarly notions of iconography, they don't work. Because mm -hmm. once you cross-reference all these images, there isn't an iconography because every time the image occurs or reoccurs, mm -hmm. it's differently framed, it's differently articulated, it's differently sexualized, mm -hmm. it's differently drawn. So in a sense, he destroys the theory of iconography. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps just by chance, accidentally, but he shows something that doesn't work in our learned discourses and our scholarly investigations. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work, which is a bit what Philip Orsprung is getting at in his book. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and I think that in every single one of these images, there is the promise of so much to unpack. Mm. So one could spend five years looking at one drawing, yeah. trying to find exactly where the references come from. So we know in some of the drawings he uses a publicity still from the 1961 film, The Secret Partner, which is about blackmail and a dentist. In the image Mars and Venus, there's an image of a tooth. Is there a connection there? Then there's numerology, but maybe the facts, the empiricism, mm -hmm. that doesn't matter. These are free-floating signifiers that are mm. out there in the world. What to do with this? It's to ask the question, what to do with this? And I think mm. there's great complexity to these works. And in this last week, while we've been installing the exhibition, every evening at the end of the day, I keep on coming back to the fact that these drawings seem to be undoing this idea of rational, logical, empirical thought. And perhaps there's some kind of um, prescription that's advising us to question, mm. to not accept, to shift against dogma. Mm. And dogma is surely one of the most dangerous things yeah. at any time. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think that gets it spot on. And at the same time, one can think of that as having 
an undertone of a poetic which is quite different because of the one thing after another. And sometimes one of my paradigms for that kind of poetic actually is from Wordsworth, from Tintin Abbey, where in 11 lines, the most frequently used word is and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and you think, here's, you know, a great English poet, and he's used, using the word and one time after another, mm -hmm. which creates a most astonishing mood once mm -hmm. the reader falls into that repetition. Mm -hmm. So looking at these images, they're full of ands, and mm -hmm. this one, and that one, and this one again, and now this, and now this inside that, and that zigzag around something, this zigzag suddenly becomes a swastika is on top of some kind of hippie flowering. It's perhaps a set of work made up entirely of conjunctives, mm -hmm. you know, visual conjunctives, mm -hmm. one thing and another thing and another mm -hmm. thing. Yet at the same time, it doesn't bore you or let you drop because it's clutter. Mm -hmm. It's not clutter. Mm -hmm. It's a constant process of hesitant thought, which, as you say, brings one up against the dreadfulness of dogma. Mm -hmm. I think when I was looking at them, and particularly when we saw them before, you know, a few weeks ago, I thought, what a relief it is to have fallen out of love with Rothko. <laughs> I know that's a terrible, non-dogmatic, heretical thing to say, but the point when I fell out of love with Rothko was a great moment in my art-loving life. And this, in a sense, helps me to understand it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a bad thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it, no, it, it, it's true, it's been a process of um, changing one's mind a lot, looking at mm -hmm. these things, both, as you say, within the image mm -hmm. and in relation to them as a set of images. Yes. And then also coming back to other kinds of work he does, like burying the heart or spiral jetty for that matter, looking at the degree to which the detritus in them, say in spiral jetty, in the way that detritus accumulates and changes color with the rise and fall of the water and the salt, the way that um, become, detritus becomes a new, a new medium, if you like. Mm -hmm. A new, it, it, ta it itself takes on new forms as it changes. So one can think of these images in a sense of being a detritus of what one mm -hmm. pre would previously call an iconography. Mm -hmm. An iconography of gay culture, an iconography of straight pornography, an iconography of a certain kind of uh, radical design, geometric mm -hmm. design and constructivism that he, he generates a kind of visual detritus, which is also a new substance. Mm -hmm. And that sense of layering history on top and on mm -hmm. top and on top of each yes. other. And I think perhaps that is um, one of the powerful elements of all of Smithson's work, mm -hmm. is um, the work demonstrates that history is a constant. Mm -hmm. um, everything is contingent, everything is changing and layering, and yet, this work persists mm. and, and I think we're, we're sitting here, I don't know what to do with this work and mm. I find that thrilling and amazing because there is no simple route through it and mm. surely this is one of the reasons why art matters. Yeah. We don't know what to do with it. Far from it, it's that sense of pushing and shifting and we've reproduced in this newspaper a really kind of, to use that word again, elliptical text by Smithson from 1961 mm. called The Iconography um, of Desolation. And that's just what he's doing. It's this yeah. sense of des desolation, turning down the icons and undoing itself mm. while doing it. And I think as we invite people to think with us, maybe we'll have yet more questions yeah. about this work. So I've kind of also been thinking a lot about Smithson extractivism mm -hmm. 
Smithson is a victim of extractivism because he's so impelled to do it. And at the same time, a prophet of, I don't mean a money prophet, but a prophet in the biblical mm -hmm. sense of what the world would look like when industry has vacated it and left it as nothing but a series of unintentional mm -hmm. artworks, yes. if you like. Mm -hmm. So the kind of aesthetic thinking of Spiral Jetty is a warning mm -hmm. as well as a complete work, if you like. And of course, running through these drawings is the horror, the horror of the past, the horror of images, yeah. the horror of possibilities. And perhaps the only way that one can think about the future is by recognizing the horrors of the past and mm. the horrors that are yet to come. Mm. And I think that's part of the, the texture, the, the difficulty and the usefulness and relevance of this work mm. today. Mm. The, the only thing I'd like also to throw in, which is something maybe we need to think about ourselves, um, not as a critique of Smith and such, because he's in the period he's in, but I do wonder about the land rights of these works in relation to First Peoples. Mm. I do think that's a, a, a fascinating question about what was going on. How did any of those artists who did works of that extent think about where it was they were doing and who they were mm -hmm. in relation? But I thought that Smithson has these two wonderful notions of sight and non-sight, which I think are just miraculously simple and instructive mm -hmm. and rich. And you can see that notion in these drawings as well. So to speak to the sense of this thing called land art, which mm. is not a term that Smithson chose. No. Um, the truth is in the United States, everyone is living on stolen land. Yes. And um, that um, is a fact rather mm. than um, anything that can be contested and when it comes to considering sight non-sight it returns to Smithson's interest in being both and yes. never either or sight non-sight is about being in one place and knowing there is another place and that relation that ecology that cooperation is fundamental yes. to existence so, so what I wanted to add to sight non-site was off-site mm -hmm. and it's through off-site we can introduce the problematics I'm now raising of whose land and mm. what art is what is off-site in the art of site and non-site mm -hmm. mm. so I, 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 I like to throw that in and see if it works you know for the future for mm -hmm. future ways of thinking about other work as well as his work mm. so that rather than doing it by pretending we're someone else Mm. We can do it by seeing that within our own culture there is an off. Yes. And that opening that up is something which we can do and do from within a show like this. Mm -hmm. So it's about really thinking through the short and productive period of Smithson's mm. art making and what is surrounding us in this room here is something that can revivify um, ways of thinking mm -hmm. through Smithson and undo the dogmas of scholarship around Smithson. Yeah, mm. I think so, yes. One of the things about Smithson is that he was really um, engaged with the mediatization of knowledge and mm. images. And we're sitting amongst these artworks that are using found images from magazines. Um, and Smithson himself really engaged with the distribution of his own work. So mm. as well as this exhibition here at 79, at 66 in the gallery, we have a really small display of these beautiful vintage posters, some oh. of which Smithson designed himself. Oh. So he was super aware of what it means to distribute artwork through the image. Um, and there's some real beauties there. Mm. and. I think Smithson's attention to that really reveals that he was aware of the power of circulation. And, and we really wanted to have this display of posters because the posters represent the assumptions of, of Smithson. Mm. Um, 
And to have that alongside these lesser known works, it's really a moment of opening up Smithson, this artist who really laid the ground for so much contemporary practice. Mm. But let's really look at that ground and let's think it, it through. And um, this sense of how an artist designing their own posters, and of course Smithson also designed the magazine articles that he wrote. Mm. For him, this sense, again, in today's language, of visual culture was so important yeah. to him. Well, thank you for that conversation. <laughs> it's been fun. It's been fun. <laughs>